Good afternoon. My name is Jack Schantz. I'm the coordinator of jazz studies at the University of Akron School of Music. And on behalf of all of us on the stage and all of the staff and the faculty and administration, we'd like to welcome you to this celebration of the life and music of Roland Pellucci. Before we get started, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the 17th president of the University of Akron, Dr. Matthew Wilson. Good afternoon, and welcome to the University of Akron. We're so excited to have you here today as we celebrate the life of one of our own, one of our members of our own family, Dr. Pellucci. Music is something that not only fills the air, not only makes a difference, I think, in each one of our lives, but it has the potential, and it has the reality of doing more. One of my, my favorite quotes I would like to share with you today on this occasion as we honor the, the life of Professor Pellucci. It says, music speaks what cannot be expressed. It soothes the mind and gives its rest. Heals the heart and makes it whole, flows from heaven to the soul. Dr. Pellucci founded the UA, UA Jazz Studies program and served as its coordinator. He was director of our jazz ensemble. Under his leadership, he soothed the soul of many. He touched the hearts of countless students. He brought joy to those that were around him. Under his leadership, his groups and his students earned awards at national and regional jazz festivals. They toured Europe, performed in Nice, and at a variety of different jazz festivals. When Professor Pellucci retired in the year 2000, he truly left a legacy that continues on this day. And I am honored and privileged to join with each one of you this day as we celebrate the legacy of Professor Pellucci. Thank you for the opportunity. Again, thank you for being here. And thank you for the music that is here to our, soothe our souls this day. Thank you. So this afternoon, we're going to play a lot, and we're going to reminisce a lot. And right now, we'd like to start with uh, a piece that was written by uh, a great friend of all of ours, Chaz Baker. And we're going to feature one of the most uh, outstanding alumni of the Akron Jazz Workshop, Mark Lopen, all the way from New York City. And this is uh, a little tune called Quasi-Modal. Here we go.
Wasn't that great? Doesn't this band sound great? Yeah. All right. It's great to see that big band music is alive and well in Akron, Ohio. Uh, I want to thank my old friend Jack Schantz for allowing me to play with his band, and Anna and Marcy for inviting me here today. And uh, it's really a thrill to see so many old friends and to learn that so many other people had their lives touched by Roland. And uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to hear my old friend Dave Banks play in the band today. Thank you for sitting in. And I'm looking forward to hearing lots more great music. Thank you. Yeah, just in case you didn't catch it, that, that tune was written by Chaz Baker. Chaz Baker, stand up, take a bow. Right now, I'd like to ask Anna Paolucci to come up and, uh, and read some uh, letters and telegrams and so forth that have been sent from those who are unable to be here this afternoon. Anna? Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. This is an occasion that is difficult, but lovely to be surrounded by all of you and all of your experiences, and I'm looking forward to hearing your stories. There are folks, of course, who couldn't be here, and I'm going to take a moment to read some things that they sent. People that were very important in his life, not just influenced. The first is from Adam Pace. You all know Pat Pace, and this is his son. He lives in Florida, has children, is playing, keeping the drive going, and here are the words that he sent. We all owe a debt of gratitude to anyone who devotes his life to the arts, even more so if they endeavor to pass the flame through education. We all know that Roland Paolucci exemplified such a life, and many, if not all, of you that are gathered here today received those many gifts from him. He created a foundation for countless young musicians trying to find their way, and the world is a lot better for it. I was never part of Roland Pellucci's jazz bands at Akron U, although he did invite me to play drums on a few occasional small gigs. And on one such occasion, he explained to me about my natural tendency to play way beyond the beat like way, way, way beyond the beat, as I now understand it. And at the time, I took it to heart, and it helped me to correct the problem. And I never forgot that. My love and admiration for this man, it's deeply personal. He was my father's companion and friend through all of his ups and downs. He was there the night my dad met my mom at the Embers in Akron. Now, had he not been there to serve dad's wingman, would I even exist? Who knows? Pat. Pat and Roland formed a trio in the 60s. My mother to this day describes her collaboration using words like magical and miraculous, and she uses the word tragedy to lament the fact that there isn't a single recording of any of it. Well, I'm going to edit here. Maybe unknown. If any of you know about that, shake the libraries and let's find those recordings. He was even there the very first time I played drums in public. My dad invited me to sit in with his trio. Thank you to Roy King for allowing me. It was at the Norton Brown Derby in 1973, and I was 11. Over the years, Roland commissioned several works from my dad, recorded many of them, and got some of those recordings to me recently, many of which I had never even heard. A little more than a year before my father died, Roland recorded the 20 preludes. There are no words that adequately express my gratitude for that. After my father's death, he helped me in a mammoth task of gathering and organizing and preserving my own father's manuscripts and scores. 
and helped Ray Demiata to typeset them. The loss of this man breaks my heart. He gave his heart and his soul and his life to something that he cared passionately about. And his was a successful life, a life well lived, and an example that we should all be mindful of, especially as musicians, as caretakers of music. Thank you so, so much, Roland Paolucci. And that was Adam Pace. This is from Dan Murphy, class of 2001. Dan now lives in Chicago, is a successful pianist, writer, arranger, has two daughters, was unable to make it in, and this is what he wrote. Roland, to remember our time together fondly, well, that's easy. To remember the intricacies of what was said and when or what was learned and how, well, that's much more difficult. Some of it is faded like cigarette smoke drifting away from the old loading dock before the jazz concerts. Other things have stuck with me, like I just walked out of a lesson. I can remember auditioning for you and Jack Shantz, <laughs> who I think was your grad assistant at the time, and I played a Bach two-part invention, Autumn Leaves, arranged by Pat Pace, and probably Girl from Impanema or something like that. I remember being able to interpret your exchange with Jack. He's got time. I guess you took a kid with some decent time and decided that you can fill in the blanks. They were huge blanks. You taught me about tunes, chords. You introduced me to the music of Claire Fisher. I mean, that was kind of an ongoing study in the department, as I remember. We dissected dancing song in a jazz studio class. I still have that analysis. I think you were amazed by that guy's work. You stressed how important it was to improve my sight reading. I'm still working on that, but it's a million times better now. When you assigned me a new tune and I couldn't quite play it, I would ask if you could play it, so we'd switch places. Of course, you were able to read seemingly anything, and quite well. I was amazed by this. But Roland, what I think I learned from you above all else was how to respect this lifelong learning process as well as the musicians who undertake it. You never doubted your students if they came with a good attitude. You were always there to help and answer questions about anything. Also, you always treated me with respect, so thank you. I remember working with you at Akron U, sure, but tasting your homemade lasagna, that's one of my greatest memories, along with getting to know some of your wonderful family. Since we often talked about Pat and his music, I'm including a picture from the day Pat Pace visited Akron U to hear you rehearsing his works with the big band. I was an alumni by then, but I'd learned of the visit, and I wanted to be here when two of my greatest former teachers reunited in Gazetta Hall, especially after so many years. I don't know if there are any other pictures from that day, but I'm sending you one here now. Someday, maybe we can all jam together if that stuff is true. So in the meantime, I better get to work. I got a lot of catching up to do to reach the mountains in Akron, Ohio. Dan Murphy, class of 2001. <laughs> Patty Yorton, or Pat Yorton, who's now known as Patricia Scott, sent this. I first met Roland in Akron when I was singing at the Embers, and he and Pat Pace walked in. It was 1961, a memorable year. Roland soon left tactfully, allowing Pat and me to get acquainted. Eventually, the three of us gigged around Akron, Cleveland area for the next three or four years. I left Ohio for Florida in 1970, but Roland and I kept in touch through the years. He was so generous with his brilliant talent. Incredibly, with his widespread accomplishments, he still found time to be an archivist for all of Pat Pace's music and compositions. What I'm gonna miss most of all is the emails that we exchanged. The articles, incredibly beautiful photography, the jokes and cartoons, of course. Sadly, very few people are using email anymore. <laughs> and I especially miss seeing Roland on an old computer. Rest in peace, my dear friend. I have one more from John Henry Jr., who was in the class of 91 to 93. 
and he's now a music program director in North Carolina at the A&T State U. And I'm gonna edit this a bit. I had the privilege of meeting Roland in 1987 at a careers day in the music held at the University of Akron prior to enrolling in the fall. During this event, you had the opportunity to rehearse with an ensemble for about 45 minutes and then perform. So I chose the jazz ensemble. It was a great experience playing with this band. Not only was the music wonderful, but no one, absolutely no one, can count off a tune like Roland. So soft-spoken and cool. A one, two, a one, two, three, and. Right? During my years at the University of Akron, Roland brought in several guest artists to play with the jazz ensemble, including Bill Dobbins, Carl Fontana, and Jiggs Wiggum. We also participated in the Notre Dame Jazz Festival, and I met Roland's father. While working on my master's degree in music education, he encouraged me to take the jazz trombone lessons with Paul Ferguson, in which I obliged. I learned so much from Roland and from Paul and other former students, such as Jack Schantz, who introduced me to working as a copyist. One time I remember Roland asking me, this is Roland, so are you gonna be in the jazz band? Me, yep, Roland, with his famous jeans jacket, hands in his pockets of those polyester pants and his thumbs out, grin on his face, shaking his head, and we're gonna need you, man. I constantly thank Roland for molding me into the jazz musician that I am today. And that's from John P. Henry, Jr. Thank you, Anna. Right now we'd like to have uh, Michael Sonata come up and sing a song for you with the faculty, University of Akron faculty rhythm section. Uh, may I just say that I am so very honored to be here. And uh, Marcy had requested that perhaps this song would remind her a little bit of her darling husband. And I'm so happy to be able to do it. And uh, I am shaken here, even though I've done this song many times, to be surrounded by so many people who really know what the heck they're doing uh, is really amazing. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy it. Here's a little good song by Bart Howard. Fly me to the moon Let me play among the stars let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. In other words, please be true. In other words, darling, kiss me. Fill my heart with song. Let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. song let me sing forevermore you are all I long for all I worship and adore in other words please be true
Thank you very much, Michael. Mickey. Eddie. Come on up and play. <laughs> Mickey Aritano. Eddie Pellucci. Thank you. 
Eddie Pellucci, Mickey Aritano. We'd like to uh, get the jazz ensemble involved once again. We'd like to invite one of Roland's oldest and dearest friends and was colleague and collaborator here at the university for many, many years, Professor Rich Shanklin. We're going to play a little tune with Rich. Just just a couple of very short words. It's, it's one thing to have a friend, and a friend is incredibly important. But when that friend is a colleague, when that friend is someone that you not only work with, but you absolutely depend on them for any number of unseen, unanticipated, unforeseen things, and that person comes through for you month after month, year after year. That's a special kind of friendship. This is what we're going to play for you is also a tune arranged by Chaz Baker. And this tune is dedicated to Marcy and Anna and Ilya. And it's dedicated also to my dear friend Chaz Baker. I want the very best for you, buddy. This is So Many Stars.
Right now we'd like to have one of the most prominent musicians in, and certainly in the state of Ohio, perhaps the United States. He's living in Columbus, Ohio. He came all the way up. He's one of my best friends and one of my biggest influences too. Vaughn Weister, ladies and gentlemen. He's gonna say a few words. Hi there, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I can grab the mic while Jack passes out the uh, arrangement for me. Uh, I want to uh, personally thank uh, Marcy and Anna for inviting me to participate in this wonderful event and to say that uh, it certainly is a great loss to lose our dear friend, Roland. And a lot of wonderful and brave words are being said about him. And my two cents worth is one of the great things I always admired about Roland is he knew the difference between what mattered and what didn't matter. And he kept them separate. Thank you. Hey, he 
these guys were sight reading, baby. Thank you very much, Ron Weister. Yeah. Right now, we'd like to have, I'd like to invite Ilya, Ilya Paolucci, to come up and uh, make some remarks. Hi, I'm Ilya, rolling with my dad. Uh, before I start, I would like to ask everybody that's in the back that wants a seat, please come down and sit. I'm uncomfortable seeing you standing back there. Can't be near as uncomfortable standing back there for another hour. We got seats over here, we got some here. If you want to sit down, please come do it. Caitlin and Maya and Jason and Wendy. Come on, my There you go, thank you. I'm, I'm getting uncomfortable watching that. <laughs> That's more like it, thank you. Closer I walked up here, the smarter I realized it was to number these pages, because I'm probably going to drop them. Uh, some of you have heard this story before, but please bear with me for a minute. Uh, my dad's father, Norberto Paolucci, back in 1918, left a little village in Italy called Caravile and came to a big city in America called New York. Made his way to the Grand Central Station, which is probably bigger than the village of Caravile. Can you imagine his eyes were probably the size of saucers as he, he walked around, and we can't know how long he was walking around talking to people, saying, a crono heel, a crono heel, a crono heel. And he finally said it to the right guy, a Hasidic Jew with the hat and the curls, you know, who understood what he was saying and got him the ticket and got him on the train to Akron, Ohio. So his persistence paid off. And if we look at that story, we see that little kindnesses can make a big difference. We can also see that Catholics and Jews can get along. <laughs> that's, that's very important. If you fast forward a minute here to the uh, early 70s, one of my childhood memories was the first time that I remember hearing Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the Beatles. Everybody know that one? Uh, and I think it was my mother that was telling me, well, this guy's singing and this guy's playing a guitar and this guy's playing drums, and I couldn't pick out the drums. And that sort of puzzled me because I knew what drums were, I knew what drums sounded like, but because I had seen people playing drums when I was knee-high to a duck in our living room. But I couldn't pick it out. Uh, other than that, I mean, I couldn't tell the flute from the flugelhorn, but when you see a drummer, you know what noise they're making, you know what I mean? Uh, so that was kind of, that's kind of blurry and I can't read that, and that's what that is. But the point is, I had this wonderful opportunity growing up in this house with music everywhere, and, and all of these different kinds of music, jazz, and the Beatles in Chicago, true story. Uh, there was a family friend over, again, when I was knee high to a duck, and they said they were going to Chicago. And I said, where are they playing? <laughs> I knew about the band, but nobody had ever mentioned a city. <laughs> uh, maybe I should be embarrassed by that, but actually, I kind of like that story. So there, <laughs> So there's all this music, you know, at, at, at our house, and I was very lucky to grow up around all of that. You know, in, in math class, this kid, Billy Upton, he knew all the right answers, but I knew the Beatles and Chicago and Thad Jones and the Paolucci Music Store. I don't think he knew any of that. Well, I think it was the summer before Billy made me look stupid in math class that we and the Akron Jazz Workshop moved into a bigger house. 
uh, with a big living room, and right off of that living room was this little room we called the study, sort of an office, and that's where my mother was working on her master's degree. Now, picture, if you will, this woman toiling away at her master's degree, and in the next room are a bunch of teenagers armed with drums and trumpets. <laughs> Some of y'all owe my mom an apology. Uh, <laughs> she must have thought she was in the twilight zone, I think. Uh, but what I owe to, I think I owe to my father is a lot of gratitude. You see, he never made me feel like I was supposed to be a musician. And I'm most assuredly not a musician. My sister can sing. I have two sons who, who studied music. Uh, when I sing, people think that reptiles are being tortured. <laughs> uh, but he never made me feel like I was supposed to be like him. You know, people ask me all the time, well, what do you play? You know what I tell them? I play the radio, that's what I can play. Uh, he, he helped a lot of people learn music and be music and put out music, and that's rippling on and on and on. That's why I love seeing the younger folks uh, doing this as well. But he let me find my own music, if you will, my own gig, and never did I once think that he felt bad or was disappointed in me for not doing what he was doing and what his father did. Although I trust he was relieved to see that some of my children can, can play. So I never, the best gift he left me was I didn't ever feel like I had to measure up to him. I know a lot of men that feel that they do with their fathers. And that was all on his side, his doing. It wasn't my end of the equation at all. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful for you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. How about some more music? We're lucky to have a really talented singer in the house with us tonight, and I would like to have you meet her. Peggy Coyle is going to come up and sing some for you. Peggy. And Brian Thomas is going to join her on the bass, too. This one here? Probably. Okay. Thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be part of the, the music today. And may the memory of Roland and all his contributions to our community stay with us forever in our hearts. I know it, that it will. He was a wonderful, wonderful man and a musician. My romance doesn't have to have a moon in the sky. My romance doesn't need a blue lagoon standing by. Doesn't need 
made a castle rising in Spain or oh, a dance with a constantly surprising refrain wide awake Peggy Coyle, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Right now, I'd like to uh, introduce John Moore. This is Marcy's sister, and he's going to come up and say a few words. 
Hi, I'm Marcy's brother, and if you look over here in this, in this section over here, there's a lot more of my brothers and, and sisters and uh, nephews and nieces, um, all part of the Moore family. But I, um, I met Roland uh, kind of as a surprise. I, I uh, used to make my living as a professional trumpet player, playing in symphonies and things like that. And um, after raising five kids, I learned that there are um, more lucrative ways to make a living. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I, I went into another line of work. But music has always been a very, very big part of my life. And, and I just have to say, and I think that you could say it also with your applause, just your appreciation for this fine young band and for all of these tremendous, tremendous musicians. I'm, I'm, I'm greatly honored that, that they would be here for, for someone that I care about so much. I, you know, um, you've heard a lot about Roland's um, effect and influence on young jazz musicians, on the uh, friends that he's made in, in, the, in the music business that are such fine musicians, and of his career. And uh, I, I just want to reaffirm that, you know, that uh, he is and uh, was a, just a wonderful musician. I remember when he would accompany um, my sister to Philadelphia to visit my mother who had um, battled a very long illness. And he would come and he would come and bring his work with him. And I remember one time looking at this arrangement that he did. He was going to do an, an album with um, a singer named Helen Welch. And he contributed two arrangements to it. And, um, and, he, and just the enthusiasm and the skill, because he had it all laid out on Finale and uh, showed me and he played it for me. And then when Helen Welch finally recorded it, he sent me a recording of it. And I got to really appreciate just what a great, fine musician um, he was. Another time he was showing me a work that he was doing. He was doing Mazorsky's pictures at an exhibition and arranging that for a jazz band. And um, so I was just overwhelmed with the skill and, um, and his beautiful piano playing and everything else. But I want to tell you that there was more to Roland than music too because he was my sister's husband. And he was the kindest and most generous man that I've ever known. And <laughs> I just want, want you to know that, that the character that made him such a great educator, the character that made him such a great friend, the character that made him such a great father, was also a character that made him a great husband. And so I just want to thank you all for honoring my sister, honoring the memory of Roland, and, uh, and just to give thanks to God. You know that the uh, more lucrative um, more lucrative business that I'm in right now, I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian pastor uh, in Florida. <laughs> So, but one thing, one thing that I want all these musicians to know, you know, that, that um, according to the Bible, God is the greatest music lover on earth. And the book of Psalms ends with a, with a psalm that says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Sound, of, sound is praise with the trumpet. Sound is praise with the strings. Sound is praise with the clanging cymbals. Sound is praise with the, all the cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So as a pastor, I'm also just so grateful for your praising of the Lord with your great and beautiful music. And, uh, and I want to thank all of you for taking the time to remember uh, my brother-in-law, Roland. Thank you very much. I'd like to, I'd like to bring up my, my sister. She doesn't like to hear it that often, but she's my older sister. And uh, that's Marcy Ann. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It means so much. And if you look at your program, there is a quote that I wanted there. I'm a big Shakespeare lover, and that quote is, if music be the food of love, play on. <laughs> the love that Roland had for his music and for his students and his family carries over to this day. Jack Schantz was his student. Mark Gonder was his student. Mark Lopeman. Uh, Mr. Banks. Uh, Mr. Ferguson. 
And uh, I said, Paul, Paul. And he was so blessed to have you in the Akron Jazz Workshop and as students because he loved what you did at the Montreux Jazz Festival. That was so much to him. And when we had the reunion concert, I think six years ago, he was just thrilled that so many of you folks could play together again as you did at Montreux. Uh, gosh, I was doing really well, John, till you talked. <laughs> I have to apologize to Roland. He never liked the acoustics in this hall. <laughs> and once Jack took over, he would always sit in the front row. And people would ask him, Roland, why do you always sit in the front row? And he'd say, because Jack won't let me sit on stage. That's the best place to be in this hall, is on stage. But I'm sure everything has sounded beautiful today. This was a man who encouraged me and supported me so much that I actually learned how to believe in myself. And I think that that dedication and passion and fierceness for supporting people he loved was what he also gave to his students. And if he saw anything in them, he would encourage them to be the best that they could be. And I think we can all see that that has happened. Amen. Um, thank you. So there's a few people here, um, the Thackerberries, Mary Jo and Neil. Roland <clears throat> participated greatly in their performances of Nat King Cole when they were at Actors Summit. And Roland loved that. He was playing the Nat King Cole piano parts while a young man played Nat King Cole. And Roland brought in two students to play guitar and bass, and they did a wonderful job, and he treasured that memory as well. And of course, Barbara Knight, he loved doing arrangements for you, <clears throat> as well as Helen Welch. He loved all of his musician friends so much, and I'm glad that you are all here today to express your love for him. And I will miss him so much. Thank you. Right now, we'd like to invite Anna and Tom Davis to come up and do a tune. Good timing. I love you, Marcy. So there's one more thing I would like to read before I attempt to not burst into tears singing a tune. Uh, an elder from across the seas, for obvious reasons that couldn't make it here, Norma sent this. To my dear cousin Roland, from the time you moved to Akron as a teenager until you left us, you were the only cousin to follow me wherever we were. It was you that kept me in touch with my roots. We had so many good and funny incidents to talk about all those years. You were very special to me and you always will be. I will remember you and keep you in my heart until we're together again. 
So keep a place for me at that jazz club, damn it, your loving cousin, Norma. Now, Norma's pretty religious, so for her to say anything like that's pretty interesting. But, uh, you know, sometimes those folks can throw down. So this is Tom Davis, who plays with Von Wiester's big band in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and <laughs> graced me with six to eight months of his amazing talent with my jazz little combo in Columbus, Ohio called Anna and the Consequences. And after hearing Tom play at Blue Jazz, my dad came up to me and he said, this is the best the band has ever sounded. So I'm happy to have him do this tune with us. Thank you. 
But now all is gone, gone is the rapture that thrilled my heart, gone with the wind, gone is the gladness that It's so lovely to hear the upright bass because that's what I grew up hearing my father play and remembering him playing. So thank you so much for that. I would like to get the jazz ensemble involved again. I'd like to bring up the uh, current director of the Cleveland Jazz Orchestra, fantastic trombonist, Paul Ferguson. This is a uh, this is a tune by Chaz Baker entitled "Gratitude," and this is how we all feel. So, uh, 38 years ago, I, I began rehearsing with the Akron Jazz Workshop, and Roland's running rehearsals. I'm a senior in high school, and Roland's assistant was Chaz Baker, who arranged or actually composed the next piece. And then sometimes when Roland and Chaz couldn't make it, Jack Shantz would run a rehearsal. So 38 years ago, I am just assaulted essentially by the holy trinity of jazz education in Northeast Ohio. <laughs> Awfully good stuff. And this is what Roland did. He just introduced you to people. Like he would introduce, he'd introduce me to Pat Pace. You know, Pat Pace, you know, just the, the relationship between Roland and Pat was really extraordinary. And, and for me to study with Pat, you know, thanks to Roland introducing us, was really great. Uh, one time I was having a lesson with Pat, and it's kind of a composition lesson. I'm throwing in a chord every eighth note. It's really just a mess of stuff, and Roland happened to be there, and I leave my lesson, and Roland says to Pat, you know, hey, Paul's really using a lot of chords, isn't he? And Pat says, yeah, he'll, he'll get over it. <laughs> so. Anyway, this, uh, this next piece by Chaz Baker has just the right number of chords and, uh, and other notes, so... Uh, very happy to play gratitude and express uh, my gratitude to Roland, but also to Jack, Chaz, and uh, Mark Lopen was another one of my teachers. I was just so fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with the right people. So uh, hope you enjoy Chaz's piece here. Oh, 
right now we'd like to have invite Howie Smith to play something by himself.
just like to point out to you, ladies and gentlemen, that there are envelopes out in the atrium that you may make a contribution if you so choose to the Roland Paolucci Music Scholarship Fund. Um, that would be a, uh, a very lovely and fitting gesture on your part. In 1974, I was a 20-year-old college dropout. I was living with my parents. I was working a factory job. And I was adrift. My dad was the chairman of the fundraising drive for the new University of Akron Wayne College in Orville. And he was working with the head of development here at the university, a man by the name of James Banks. Turns out they both had sons who played the trumpet. My dad heard about this group called the Akron Jazz Workshop, and we drove up to hear them play a concert. This was my first encounter with Roland. I had never seen anyone like him. He had a neon blue blazer. He had this way of counting off the band. It was so animated and so swinging. He combed his hair between tunes. <laughs> he acknowledged every soloist after they played with this amazing gesture. I was really knocked out by the lead trumpet player. It was Dave Banks. The drummer was so loose and so swinging. It was Mark Gonder. Both would become my lifelong friends and musical partners. So after the concert, Dad and I went down backstage to meet Roland, and he was very, very gracious to my dad. And but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't read his face. He had one eye that went off to the side. <laughs> and I kept looking over in that direction. <laughs> and he sensed that I was uneasy, and he said to me, hey, man, look at me in this eye. <laughs> that, that won me over right there. Over the next few months, I, I gradually became a member of the workshop. And it was a turning point in my life. What really nailed it down was this. I, I decided to blow off a rehearsal. I just, I just didn't show up. And I didn't call or anything. And the next time I showed up, Roland took me aside. And this was the only time Roland ever spoke harshly to me. And he said, don't rip us off. Take care of business. I had disrespected him and the scene he was trying to create. That slap has reverberated throughout my whole life. What he was saying to me was that this music, our music, was something very big, bigger than any one of us. And that we had the opportunity to be of service to this music somehow, that we could learn its secrets and pass them on to others with generosity and enthusiasm, that we could play the music with integrity, with precision, and with passion and respect for its tradition that we had a responsibility to the music to be professional, always show up early and be prepared, that we could cheerfully and endlessly schlep equipment, <laughs> set up and tear down the stage, and attend to thousands of details that happened behind the scenes so that the music could happen, that we could be engines for creating new music 
and experience the thrill of playing something that was written just for us. Over the next four years, I gradually became Roland's sidekick and his protege. He started hiring me for gigs. I hung out with him constantly. We drove together all the time. He had a very exotic car at the time. It was a 1969 Rover 3500S. This, this made a huge impression on me. <laughs> and began a love of European cars that I've had for the last 40 years. When he founded the jazz program at this university, many of us in the workshop followed him here. During my first year in school, I rented the attic of his house and became a part of his family, along with Anna, Ilya, Eric, and his first wife, Mary, and his mom and dad. Oh, man, his parents could cook. <laughs> I was initiated into the inner circle of real Italian cooking. Homemade sauce, homemade pasta, meatballs, prajol. He introduced me to the Akron Italian jazz scene. Pat Pace, Phil Palumbo, his cousin Eddie Pellucci, Mickey Aritano, John Orsini, Danny Mazzocco, Lou Siriano, Gene Fiocca. I think my association with Roland imparted on me a certain amount of street cred with them. I knew I'd always wanted to be a jazz musician, but, but after hanging out and playing with these guys, I realized what I really wanted was to be Italian. <laughs> Roland had an extensive record collection, and I went through the whole thing, especially the Miles Davis, Gil Evans records, George Russell, New York, New York, tons of Stan Canton, Woody, Basie, Ellington. I listened to them over and over and over in his little study with these enormous Koss headphones. By the time we finished college, he had molded us into an incredibly good big band. Good enough to back up Phil Woods, Clark Terry, Bob Brookmeyer. Good enough to record an album. Good enough for us to play at the Notre Dame and Montreux Jazz Festivals. Good enough, good enough for us to tour Europe. Good enough that most of us found work in the music business right out of school. He had prepared us all for a life in music. My dad used to say, there are two good times to plant a tree, right now and 40 years ago. <laughs> Over the years, Roland planted hundreds and hundreds of seeds. Some fell by the wayside. Some fell in rocky soil. Some were devoured by the birds but many, many found fertile ground and grew 20, 60, and 80-fold. I'm but one of them. Over the years, I played with Roland on countless jazz gigs, club dates, record sessions, concerts, dances, and shows that he contracted, all of them characterized by professionalism, high-quality players, and no weirdness. He was always trying to get better wages for us. And you just knew if you were playing a gig for Roland, it would have all three ingredients of a great gig. Good music, good players, and good bread. He showed us how to take care of business. Roland was the most gentle, generous, and loyal friend I have ever known. I had so many laughs with him. I cried in his shoulder so many times. I sought his advice on so many things. I asked him for countless favors. He advocated for me constantly, mostly, mostly without my knowing about it until much later. This is what Roland Pellucci was to me. He was a teacher, a boss, 
a producer, an engineer, a guardian, a second father, a mentor, a role model, a wingman, a confidant. He was the single most important influence in my life. In all of the triumphs and tragedies, the miraculous and the mundane, the congratulations and the commiserations, we were together. The last words I spoke to him were a song title. You're my everything. Everything that I have done that I am proud of, I did either standing on his shoulders or coasting down a path that he had already cleared. To my great sorrow, I never told him that often enough. So this afternoon, from me, and on behalf of the countless people whose lives would be very, very different had it not been for him, thanks, Roland. Thanks for everything. We'd like to conclude the program now with a little blues. We're going to invite anybody who hasn't played yet already and who wants to play to come up and, uh, and sit in on this. And uh, following this, of course, there is a reception in the uh, atrium, and I, I encourage you to, to look over all of the fantastic uh, print material that Marcy has put together. It's, re it's really amazing. So here we go. Okay, here we go.